With only a few weeks left in the regular season, what should the Habs be focusing on? We'll talk about this and more on Hockey Inside Out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Hockey Inside Out. I am your host, Jessica Rusnak. Joining me this week, we've got the usual gang for the panel. We have Stu Cowan from the Montreal Gazette. We have a former NHLer, Stanley Cup champ and former assistant coach with the Montreal Canadiens, Rick Green. And we have independent hockey analyst, Andrew Berkshire, joining us this week. Now, the Montreal Canadiens are faced with a challenge. Head coach Martin St. Louis has stepped away from the team due to family reasons. What kind of impact do you think not having St. Louis behind the bench for an uh, undetermined amount of time will have on this team? Stu, you want to share your thoughts first? Well, the game in Calgary, it seemed to have a bit of an impact on them, a bit of a shock maybe to the team. He had left on Friday after dinner and the game Saturday, but then... uh, you know, the game in Edmonton, their compete level, which has been the most impressive thing about this team all season, was there again. It, it looked like, um, you know, you wouldn't have noticed that Marty St. Louis wasn't behind the bench. They, you know, back Trevor Letowski and him get along so well. And, and Letowski, you know, was always a guy standing beside Marty on the bench uh, during games while Robida takes care of the defense and Burroughs takes care of the offense. Um, it seems to be a pretty smooth transition considering everything that went on. And the compete level against Edmonton, that's the one, I think the biggest thing that Marty St. Louis has been able to build with this team so far in the rebuild is just the way the players compete and they still want to play. They still want to win, even though there's, you know, there's no hope of getting into the playoffs. Uh, Yoel Army has become sort of the poster boy for that. I mean, his compete level is, is it's remarkable how much it's improved over the last month, a uh, month or so. So, it will have an impact, I think, as they move forward. Um, Marty's still keeping in touch with the team. Trevor Letowski told reporters in Edmonton that he's in touch with them a couple of times a day. Um, so it's not like he's totally out of touch with the team. But I don't think it's going to have a huge impact moving forward just because this team, the, the culture has already been built in the locker room. And I think that's just going to continue. Yeah, I agree I agree with Stu. I mean, the expectations of the players, uh, you know, is, is there. Martin St. Louis has... As, as kind of <clears throat> excuse me and taught them to uh, to to follow and believe in uh, his teachings and that is to compete uh, to show up and to you know to play each and every shift and uh, you know the the players uh, the players kind of rally sometimes around a situation like this where they want to do it for their coach that they really respect and uh, you want to carry on with a lot of the good ways and the the bottom line out of all of this is just like a lot of us, just so so hopeful that the news uh, is not too serious and that he can uh, take care of, which is the most important thing in his life, his family. And, uh, you know, we can look uh, past this and say it's a little bump in the road and he can get back to doing what he wants to do. And his family and everybody around him can be well and enjoy uh, and enjoy themselves. So... We, uh, we pray for good things uh, out of the, all this. But, uh, the bottom line, the players uh, know what they have to do. He's instilled a lot of good things with them. And uh, judging from what they're, do- they're doing the last two games, uh, it's going to carry on. Yeah, I, I agree with both of the, the gentlemen before me. Uh, not to be boring, but I think the main thing is this is a test, right, uh, for the team. We've talked a lot about culture over the last couple of years here and what Marty's been able to instill in terms of competitiveness uh, amongst the team. Now we see, you know, not to say that Trevor Lutowski isn't a coach that can coach a team, right? Like he doesn't have the experience per se, but now the, the head of the team is gone, right? The guy who's in the dressing room who, you know, uh, leadership rolls downhill. So if Marty, Marty St. Louis is no longer there, we see if the established culture that he's put in place can carry itself through without him. And I think that's really interesting in a season where the rest of it was not really that interesting, right? So I guess there's a silver lining here. Obviously, we all hope that uh, Marty and his family are as good as possible, uh, that everything works out for the best. But for the Montreal Canadiens, now the end of the season is, is a little bit of a switch up. We've seen them play their best hockey over the last couple of years in the last month or so. We'll see if they can carry it through. The signs are pretty good. The performance against Edmonton was really strong. Uh, Calgary, the 
penalties were a little bit much, but at even strength, again, they were pretty strong. So we'll see if they can keep this level of play the rest of the season. Obviously, there's not going to be very many wins. We've seen that now. They, they seem to continually play really, really well and just find a way to lose. But that's kind of what you want at this stage, right? I think as much as there's frustration in that dressing room, they want to get the wins now. They want to have those emotional highs. I think staying hungry at the end of this season might be more important going forward than a win here and there. Well, the fact Trevor Letowski has been a head coach before also in the OHL helps because he's, he's run a bench before as the head guy, so he knows what that's all about. And the thing with this Canadiens team also, it's been the family first thing, Rick, as you mentioned, that's that's from the top down. That's starting with Jeff Gordon, Kent Hughes, Marty's spoken of it before when other players had issues, saying it's always, it's always family first. And that's the case right now with Marty St. Louis also. And the, the thing is, they built a family atmosphere in this locker room. I mean, being in that locker in the locker room on a regular basis, these guys like each other. They're like uh, I've mentioned several times on this show. They're like a band of brothers, and and that's they compete for each other. I mean, thirty nine of their sixty eight games have been one goal games. You know, they they just don't have the offensive talent up front and the forwards that to, to score the extra goal or two. You know, Cole Caulfield hasn't been scoring the way people expected him to at the beginning of the season either. So once I mean, and Ken Hughes spoke about this. Uh, he did an interview with Eric Engels this week, and he talked about, you know, he knows. Like, they, they need more forwards who can score goals, and that's something that he'll be looking to improve as this rebuild moves forward. Now, Rick, you've been an assistant coach before. Is it a tough transition for Trevor Letowski to uh, take over the head coaching job? What are, what are some of the, the new pressures that are on him that he didn't have to face before as an assistant? Well, one, one thing that hasn't changed is the workload is shared, uh, you know, amongst them. Um, my experience as an assistant for over 11 years was, uh, basically there's a, a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that people don't realize as far as, you know, pre-scouting the opposition, uh, trying to drop a, a game plan, uh, certain, uh, things to look out for, uh, in game preparation. And that's where the assistants do a lot of the legwork and, uh, Trevor Letowski will, uh, will probably ultimately deliver the, you know, the, the message, if you will. It used to come down to you, everybody had their special team meetings and then you'd have a, a whole team meeting uh, at the end. And that's when the head guy would basically deliver the type of uh, details uh, that he was looking for for that particular game. But there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of time that's spent on video. You analyze opposition, you analyze your team, you analyze individuals. I know there's a lot of people that, uh, are much more involved in those details of the game than what there was back in my day. But there's still uh, a lot of uh, information that has to be shared, has to be uh, discussed. And, you know, as a group, they have to uh, gather and decide which is the best route to go as far as, uh, you know, they're pretty well set as far as their lines go, but just making sure that they're uh, being prepared and be the best they can be. So it's a challenge. Uh, but at this stage of the game, I think that uh, they have shown that they're ready to meet the challenge and um, the, the guys understand what their, their jobs are. And now it's a matter of going out and doing it each and every night. The, the other big change for Letowski is he has to deal with the media now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, since he took over, since he was hired by the Canes, I think he spoke with us once before this happened. Um, he doesn't speak French either. And we all remember Randy Cunningworth, how that didn't work out too well for him. Uh, I also remember when Claude Julien uh, was taken to hospital during the bubble playoffs in Toronto and Kirk Muller filled in. The Canadians felt compelled to apologize for the fact Kirk Muller couldn't speak French in his interviews. They didn't do that this time uh, with Trevor Letowski. So there's, there's a lot of, I mean, that's probably the biggest change for him is having to deal with the media a couple of times a day. And it'll be interesting to see how long he lasts here and how um, patient some members of the French media are with the fact that the Canadians have an interim head coach who doesn't speak uh, both languages. And it's interesting because wonder... they do have two other assistant coaches that are bilingual, but I think it's, you know, Trevor Letowski was the guy that had the most experience and probably the best person to take over the, the, the duties at the moment. Yeah, and the same with Kirk Muller when he took over from Claude Julien. Kirk was the same thing. He was the guy right beside Claude on the bench, right? Well, the other guys. So it's uh, Trevor Letowski is the, the, the obvious pick to fill in as head coach right now. I, it is surprising, though. I feel like when you've got a situation like this where a coach has to take a leave of absence, it just makes sense to me if an assistant is the one who's having to fill in 
and, and do the extra responsibilities, why don't we help him out a little bit if you're the Montreal Canadiens and have Alex Burroughs go out there with him for, for, for meeting the media. You know, your, your coaching staff, you can present a unified message, but then you've got uh, somebody there who does speak French, who can communicate with the media and the fan base. And I don't think it takes anything away from Trevor Litowski or his, uh, like his authority as the head coach temporarily. It's surprising to me that more teams don't make their assistance a little bit more available. I feel like, fans and media would be happier if we were able to hear from these people a little bit more often and get a little bit more clarity on the day to day. The okay, Canadians okay. Never, before the Canadians never did that. Like Mark Bergeron would never let assistant coaches or anybody talk. They've done it from time to time. Stefan Robert has spoken a couple of times, as I mentioned, Latowski, I think once, but I agree with you, Andrew. And I think the longer Marty might be away, I think we might, and plus they're on the road now, but when they're back home, I can see them maybe bringing in Robida one day to face the media instead of uh, Latowski, just to, to give to give Latowski a bit of a break for one, and also to satisfy the uh, French media demands, uh, who, you know, they'd like to get interviews that aren't all subtitles underneath. I don't, I agree. I don't think it's a bad idea, um, you know, uh, to take care of the, the, the French side of things. And, Let's face it, these guys as a group uh, are together a lot. There's a lot of discussions that go on behind closed doors. So they're all on the same page. Discussions are happening on what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. And uh, so there's there's no real uh, difference in the mindset as far as what they need to do uh, to prepare their team to, uh, you know, to put their, their best game out there. So to satisfy the, the media with, uh, you know, a French and an and English uh, uh, spin on things. W- why not at this time? And I think the fans uh, and the media have been pretty patient uh, so far to see that this, the process that is involved with Montreal Canadiens is, uh, is challenging at times. And at this particular point, it is challenging for the organization and to respect what they're trying to do, which is the right thing to get them over this hump and, and get things back to the way they were before. And the thing, I don't think a lot of fans realize, Rick, and you know it firsthand, the time commitment to being a head coach or an assistant coach in the NHL. Marty St. Louis was asked about it earlier this season, you know, why did somebody asked, you know, how come there's only two Hall of Fame players, himself and Patrick Waugh, now coaching in the NHL? And he said, it's just the commitment, right? That's 20, as he said, it's five, seven days a week, 24 7, dealing with the media, everything else, meetings, you know, players. On a practice day, they finish practice at around noon in Brossard, and the, they got all day to time to kill. Uri Slavkowski spoke about that this week, talking about David Reinbacker coming to Laval and some of the adjustments he might have. One of them says you got a lot of free time. Coaches don't have a lot of free time. <laughs> you know, the players leave the rink at noon. Coaches are doing video. They're preparing for practice the next day. They got meetings. They got it, it's a real, real demanding job, and that's why Marty Saint Louis he knew when he finished his career he wanted to coach. But he wanted to be with his family. He thought his son, three sons were too young and he didn't want to leave them at that age. So he focused on his family and he coached his kids in hockey in Connecticut. And he told his wife, you know, the only way I would leave early is if I got a head coaching offer, but that's never going to happen. <laughs> and it, did. it was too good of an offer for him to turn down. But it's a it's a huge commitment. And and a lot of guys, you know, especially in today's NHL, when guys retire, they have a, they've made millions and millions of dollars. They don't need the money. Marty St. Louis doesn't need the money to do this job. He just needed his Patrick Watt. But they both have that passion for hockey. They live, breathe, sleep hockey. They they love it, but it's a huge commitment. And, and the way the games are scheduled, some, sometimes four games, you know, in, in the week is a tough grind. And, you know, you finish one game and uh, your job as an assistant is like, okay, let's get on – to the next game and uh, you're back at it looking at video and, and you know analyzing what uh, what you should be trying to do and what you shouldn't be doing so it just it's a continual process of uh, of time consuming uh, analyzing just uh, your your group uh, along with uh, the team that you're uh, you're playing up next and it's uh, it's it's challenging and tiring at time but anyways it's uh, it's all part of it, and you just want to uh, uh, do your the, your legwork so that you can prepare the players. And the players are the first ones to know when you're not prepared and the information that you're giving them it uh, doesn't make sense for them. So you got to be on your toes. But it's a it's a healthy environment, and the respect that you gain, uh, you know, as a group is one that is earned 
through the information you give them that you believe will work and you deliver that message and they buy it. And the fact that Canadians still compete the way they are, Rick, that just speaks volumes about how much the players are buying into what the coaching staff is, is selling them. And, and I always, you know, I always, uh, working with young defensemen, I always believed, and I probably would have been the same way, even though I didn't have anybody that taught me anything in Washington, uh, <laughs> other than, you know, what not to do. But uh, <laughs> the fact is just try and get the information, give them technique and give them uh, some some tricks on what you believe will work. And then, you know, I always said, you try it and then you you tell me afterwards whether or not you think that is the best approach and the best way to look at uh, situations. And more times than not, uh, I, I sold them on uh, a few things that, uh, that kept me hanging around for a few years. Well, we saw what a team looks like when they're not buying what the coach is selling at the end of Dominic Ducharme's reign as head coach, right? The players are just tuned him out and you know Jeff Gordon had said that season that he wasn't going to make it when he took over as uh, vice president of hockey operations said he wasn't going to make a coaching change that season but then it got to the point he had to like it just couldn't continue the way it was the players had obviously stopped playing for the coach and something had to be done now heading into Thursday night's game against the Vancouver Canucks there's 14 games remaining in the regular season for the Canadians what do you think the goal should be as they go into this last push uh does not look like they're going to make the playoffs uh they're not mathematically eliminated just yet but uh it would take a miracle for it to happen Andrew what do you think the goal should be I think the goal has to be consistency, right? Uh, you want to get the players who are going to continue being on this team long-term playing a lot. I think that uh, the two top lines right now are both clicking pretty well. Uh, you want to keep getting those guys out there. You want to make sure that the players who are having a rough season, maybe like Josh Anderson, for example, has some opportunity to get his confidence back, but it can't be at the expense of players who deserve to play more. I think you got to continue with the meritocracy at the end of the season here. Remember that it's almost over. <laughs> Try not to get too down on yourselves because uh, frankly, I know we've talked about it all year long. This team has competed so much harder than anybody expected at the beginning of the season, especially losing Kirby Doc in game one. I know that the wins haven't been happening a lot lately, but for one, I'm extremely impressed with the competitiveness, especially at even strength lately, the improvements on the penalty kill, you know, the improvements on the power play over the last couple of months. There's a lot of positives going on with this team. I think the main focus has to be maintaining those positives and continue to build little bits on top of what's working. No, one goal losses are perfect right now. <laughs> the competes there and then you're not racking up points in the standings which is going to help your your draft situation uh, for this year i think one of the big spotlights for the rest of the season is caden primo can he handle the backup role moving forward uh, sam montembo has proven and he proved it again in edmonton that he's a legit number one goalie and the number one goalie's job is to give your team a chance to win every game and Montembeau does that just about every game. He did it in Edmonton again. He keeps the team in there. So it'll be interesting to see how many games that Caden Primo starts. I imagine it'll be with 14 left. I imagine he's probably going to start five or six anyway. Uh, see how that goes. And the other interesting thing is how much longer do they keep Joshua Waugh here before sending him to Laval? Um, it's going to happen at some point, I'm pretty certain, uh, to help that team get into the playoffs. They're three points out of the final playoff spot with 12 games left uh, this week. Wa would definitely give them a boost. And they're weighing, you know, Kent Hughes has spoken with this, Marty said they're weighing like what's best for him, what's best for the Canadians, and what's best for Laval. Uh, but at some point, he's going to go down to Laval, and hopefully for him and probably Jaden Struble also, a, long, a playoff run with Laval would be really good for them with their development as much as I'm sure they don't want to go back down there. But uh, one thing that this Canadian management team has really been good at is they're honest with their players. And before they would make that move, I'm sure they would explain to them why it's being done, why it's the best thing for their development, and how you know they're going to be back here next season. And, and really, you got to give them the, the team full credit for the type of effort that they're giving because it's not it's not fun knowing that you're not really going to make the difference uh, to get yourself in the playoffs. And that's that's kind of a tough situation when it comes down to guys really wanting to do their very best uh, each night. But looking at this group, uh, there's a lot of pride. There's a lot of guys that really care about each other. And it's showing up, even though they're not getting the results, it's showing up as a group. And 
an opportunity for some of the young guys to continue to progress and hone some of their skills and improve on uh, a number of areas of their game that is improving. They have to keep that going in the right way. Uh, but it, it is a healthy environment, even though it's a losing uh, time for them. Uh, the guys are taking a lot of uh, uh, pride and, and desire to, uh, to show well, do a good job, and do their very best right to the end. Yeah, I asked Jordan Harris before they left on the road show about the compete level and how it's been able to stay so high. And he had a great answer. It's because losing sucks. <laughs> they hate losing. And he says, and they're, they're holding each other accountable in the room. And he said, and he said, it's frustrating all the one goal loss because they realize like they're right there. As I mentioned earlier, they're just lacking that offensive talent up front to win more of those games. But to have a, a, a young guy like that talking, you know, when the season's more or less over as far as playoffs concerned, like how much they hate losing. And I think that's the big reason why they compete so hard. They hate losing this team. They really do. They compete hard and they're trying to win. They just don't have the talent yet to win, but it's only year two of a rebuild. Uh, and there's a lot of reason for hope moving forward. And I think the biggest reason for hope is that compete level. Now it's up to Kent Hughes to find more offensive talent. The, you know, the, the heat's going to get on him that to give these guys the help they need to win more of these games. What All right, moving on to yeah. rapid fire. The Montreal Canadiens lost 3-2 in overtime to the Edmonton Oilers Tuesday night. Every single time they seem to play these top teams, they're able to elevate their game. We're not seeing them be blown out 6-1, to one, even though heading into the game, if you look on paper, you're going to say, this is going to be a rough night for the Canadians. Uh, but they were down in this game against the Oilers in that third period. They came back, forced it to overtime. Why do you think that they're able to keep up with some of these top teams in the league and they're just missing that finish that they need at the end? Uh, Rick, what's your thoughts on it? Well, it's that's a good good question. I mean, maybe they're uh, you know we've we've talked about the pride and the desire uh, to to you know playing well and competing hard, but maybe they don't want to get embarrassed or something. I, I don't know. They just seem to uh, really dig in and want to do uh, everything they can possibly do to uh, show that they can play against some of the top teams, and that's a good indicator of you know the group when you can get them to respond that way and give the top teams in the league a really tough go. And uh, again, this is an area that they, they can build on and, and take pride in moving forward that they know that they have the opportunity or, you know, uh, a pretty good group to go toe to toe with some of the top teams and, and not be embarrassed. So again, uh, give them full credit. They uh, they respond in a, a very positive way, and they they show up and and dig in. And uh, you know they're not getting the results, but uh, the process is happening in a in you know a, a more favorable way than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, I think for me the answer is relatively simple, and it's Nick Suzuki. Uh, I mentioned earlier on the show that I think leadership rolls downhill, and from the moment he entered the league, you could tell that he gets up for games where he's going to have a tough assignment, uh, where he can play against the best players in the world. We saw it in the playoffs already on that playoff run in 2021. We've seen it at times when there's been struggles on the team where he's like the only center on the roster and he'll still play like 26 minutes and have a great game. I think the way that Nick Suzuki approaches the game bleeds through the roster and other players get excited in the same way. I see it the same way as, you, you listen to people who talk, cover the Pittsburgh Penguins and how like Sidney Crosby's practice habits has created a situation for Pittsburgh throughout his career where players continually get better because they're working with Sidney Crosby. And I think Nick Suzuki, obviously he's not Sidney Crosby, but has that same work ethic to him that gets players to the same level as him in terms of competitiveness. I mean, even back in junior, he orchestrated a reverse sweep, you know, in his, in his final year of junior, he's, an incredible gamer. And I think when you have someone like that, you talk about character that affects a lineup. And I think that's a big reason why the culture feels so strong on this team in a third straight losing season. Yeah. I think the young Canadians players feel they have something to prove against the better teams. And on the other hand, I think maybe some of the better teams maybe underestimate the Canadians a little bit uh, when they look at the standings, especially with teams like Edmonton that don't see them that often. I mean, during the game last night, I sent out a tweet and I said, you know, I'll say it yet again. The most impressive thing about this young Canadians rebuilding team is their compete level. And Mark Spector of sports and a long time Edmonton hockey writer responded. And he said, the compl Canadians completely outworked the Oilers in that third period. No question about it. And they did. And I think maybe that's part of 
the reason is this. The Canadians really get up for these games. I think they surprise other teams and they outwork them. And and they outwork the Oilers. And at the end, the Oilers, I mean, Dreisaitl and McDavid, four on three, it's almost not fair. You know, it's automatic. I mean, it's like, you just know they're going to score, right? Even though they killed off a th- more three minutes of that four-minute penalty army, you just knew in the back of your mind, at some point, McDavid or Dreisaitl is going to score. And they did. I mean, five on four against those guys is hard enough, but four on three, I mean... It's almost it's almost like six on three with those two guys, right? And uh, so it's not a shock that they were able to score that goal. I felt bad for Yol Army, as I mentioned before. His compete level has been so good. That was just an unlucky, unfortunate penalty. It wasn't a lazy penalty. It wasn't a dumb penalty. You know, Kane sort of hit his stick and it went up and it uh, caught the guy in the face. So I, I'm sure Yol Army feels horrible today. But uh, you know, we've we've bashed Yol Army many times on this show before when he wasn't competing hard, but uh, that wasn't his fault. He was he he might have been the Canadiens' best player on the ice against Edmonton. He really had a good game. Now, big uh, talking point this season is Cole Caulfield and the goals not really coming the way that I think a lot of people anticipated. Now, Martin St. Louis was asked about this, and he said if you reverse uh, Cole Caulfield's assists and goals, fans would be happy. Uh, going into Thursday night's game, he's got 20 goals on the season and 33 assists. Do you agree with this statement from uh, St. Louis, Stu? It's, it was an interesting statement when he said it because it's true. If he had you know the 33 goals, people wouldn't be complaining. And you know, Marty St. Louis said earlier this season, and he said it quite a few times actually, is I'm not going to make Cole Caulfield a better goal scorer. He knows how to score, but I can make him a better hockey player. And I think we're seeing signs of Cole Caulfield becoming a better hockey player this season, becoming more of a playmaker. Uh, the way he back checks, uh, the way he works, uh, he stayed healthy for every game. But at the end of the day, the Canadians are paying Cole Caulfield seven point eight five million a year. He's actually making nine point nine seven five million this year to score goals. That's why he got that big money is to score goals. So he needs to score more often, and nobody knows that more than Cole. Uh, ESPN did a good feature on him uh, this week, and they asked, "You know, what's your favorite goal?" And he said, "My next one," and that's mm-hmm. the way goal scorers think like he, he's a goal scorer he will score I mean his shooting percentage is, is half of what it was last season that we mentioned I think last week on the show it's hard to figure out why he's not scoring more <clears throat> but he is a goal scorer and Marty St. Louis has indeed turned him into a better all-around hockey player but he does need to score more as he said he said nothing you know 20 goals is the the minimum that he he want he like he considers that a minimum for a season so you know we'll see what happens next year and if he can he can get over 30. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting statement from Marty. I don't know if I would necessarily agree. I I know that uh, a lot of fans are clamoring for Caulfield to score more, but at the same time, if he was scoring to his potential, they'd probably be worrying about a draft pick, right? <laughs> so it's kind of a, a good season for Caulfield's shooting to fall apart. But I actually uh, wrote about this last Saturday, uh, talking about Cole Caulfield, and I dug deep into all the signs to figure out what's going on with Cole Caulfield. And the biggest change between this year and last year is straight up his shooting percentage at five on five. Last year, it was one of the best in the league. Uh, This year, it's, I believe, just under 5%. The league average for forwards in that game state is something like uh, 9%. And overall, league average shooting percentage for forwards this year is like 12%. So looking at Cole Caulfield, he's getting more scoring chances than any year prior. He has a higher expected conversion rate per shot look like for per shot than he has at any other point in his career. He's creating more uh, goals for his teammates than any other point. So like all these signs are pointing to good things happening, but he's cursed or something this season. He, he made some witch really angry or something. And she boiled some special thing and she's got a voodoo doll that's stabbing him. But uh, everything that Caulfield's doing right now, I think is a, a good progress mark for next year. It probably won't, figure itself out. There's not enough time left this season, but I I'm just not worried about him. He over the previous three seasons fits into a cohort among the NHL's best goal scorers in terms of outperforming expectations based on his shot locations, in terms of generating scoring chances, uh, power play at even strength, everything. He's going to be an excellent goal scorer, but nobody outside of like Matthews or, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, David Pasternak are truly immune to this kind of season happening once in a while. Even the best goal scorers outside of the super hyper elite have an off season, and that's just what it's been for Caulfield. And in true Martin St. Louis fashion, you know, he's trying to deflect some of the pressure that's on Cole Caulfield for not getting the results uh, in the 
in his goal scoring and, you know, making him a, a better all-around player kind of uh, covers, uh, covers him and puts him into a, a, a different category. But I mean, you know, Andrew, you, you touched on his, uh, his numbers and, you know, when you look at uh, some of his stats and you look at some of the games that he's played that he hasn't scored, um, yeah, they were going in, you know, obviously a lot more often than not last year, but he's get, he's given opportunities. He's got, uh, you know, almost a, almost a point a game. Uh, he's bringing something, an opportunity each night. He's, he's given chances, just not, it's not going in for him right now, but, uh, yeah, he's he's being paid a lot of money to score goals. Um, not happening, but uh, I, I like the chances that he's going to uh, get that corrected. He's going to find a way to get more pucks in the net uh, just because he is a real sniper. And I, I like to watch the way he moves around the ice and, and finds those little areas, soft spots that he can get to. And uh, obviously Suzuki uh, knows where he is and gets in the puck and He's a guy that you'd like to uh, have the puck anywhere uh, from the top of the circle down. He usually, if he doesn't score, it's going to be darn close to going in. But uh, nothing but positive for him. And his overall game is is improving. He seems to be uh, uh, competing much harder, but uh, I'm not worried about him. No, I think the most impressive stat for Caulfield this season, especially coming off that shoulder surgery, is that he hasn't missed a game. He's played all 68 games. There's only five guys in the Canadians who have done that. Jake Evans, Slavkovsky, Matheson, Caulfield, and Suzuki. And three of those guys are your number one line. Uh, so there's that saying, you know, the best availability uh, ability is availability. And the fact that those three young guys, uh, your number one line, uh, not only have we seen their chemistry connected, none of them have missed the game. Uh, you know, Slavkovsky had the knee injury last season. Suzuki's a freak. He <laughs> hasn't been able to the NHL. Uh, so to me, just the, the his... Is a bit, I, mean, I think that was a big concern going into the season, you know, with his size and the shoulder injury. Can he play a full season? And he's showing this year that he can. Now, do you think the Canadians are making a mistake having Caden Gooley play on his offside on that top pairing with Mike Matheson? Rick, you're the expert. Why don't you share your thoughts first? Well, um, in watching the way they play uh, as a group, I don't think there's such a thing as a right and a left-handed, uh, you know, designated defensemen they're they're all over the place um does it really affect uh the way they play and complement each other i think to a certain degree it does because a lot of times you get uh guys running around a little bit too much and mike matheson is is pretty good at it so he's on the left side he's on the right side he's a kind of a kind of a hard player to uh, to play with because you don't know exactly where he's going to be other than he's going to be left in the right side. So, um, yes, to a certain degree, it, it becomes difficult for pairings to, uh, you know, to complement each other when you got guys kind of running all over the place. But um, hopefully with time, they'll, they'll get to understand uh, uh, positioning a little bit more and, and be a little more, uh, you know, responsible for what their, their jobs are on the left or the right side. There's not too many 22-year-old defensemen capable to play on the top pairing in the NHL. There's very, very few capable to play on the top pairing on the wrong side. And I think that speaks volumes just about the type of player that Caden Gooley is. Um, you know, with Matheson and Gooley, they're, both of them, their strongest points are their skating. They can cover a ton of ice. They can cover up for each other. And Marty St. Louis mentioned after a recent game, they both have big lungs. Like, they log a lot of ice time and they recover quickly. But the fact that he is playing on the wrong side sort of highlights the fact why the Canadians, or one of the reasons why Canadians drafted David Reinbacker last season, because he's a right-hand shot. And they they're lack depth on that right-hand side. And moving forward in this rebuild, you can see the day when Gooley and Reinbacker are your top pairing left and right if everything works out the way the Canadians hope with Reinbacker's development. But just the fact that Gooley can do it, is comfortable doing it. I spoke with him about it recently. He said he's still learning. He still makes mistakes. Um, but the fact that a kid that young can play on both sides and log the amount of minutes he does and skate the way he does. And we saw the goal he scored against Edmonton, uh, just blowing past the defenseman and, and putting the puck in. It just it speaks volumes just about what a really good hockey player Caden Gooley is and what a smart decision Mark Bergeron made when he selected him 16th overall in the draft. 
I think there's also a bit of a method to the madness there with, with putting Gooley on his offside. I think that there's some eyes looking at what Lane Hudson is going to do after his season ends in the NCAA and he'll probably sign with Montreal and get like one to two games at the end of the year. And if that happens, maybe they throw him with Gooley as a security blanket to help him out because David Savard is playing so well with Arbor Xhaka. You don't want to really mess with that right now. And I really like Jonathan Kovacevic, but I don't know if he is capable of being the guy that a, a player like Lane Hudson needs to break into the NHL to, to help him out. So Gooley is the stable guy that makes sense there, right? And there are issues with him on the on the right side. I think the main issue that I have with him with Matheson in particular is as we saw against the Oilers with Gooley leading that rush and scoring a fantastic goal, there's a lot of offense in his game. There's a lot of transition play in his game. But with Mike Matheson, he's kind of forced to play a very stay-at-home safe role. And I think that limits him a little bit. And that's more what I see on the right side than any particular struggle with a, a specific action or like defensively stopping guys along the boards, that kind of stuff. Where there's times where he gets run around a little bit, but... Overall, positionally, he's pretty sound, but I do think long term he should probably stay on the left side. But having that versatility, there's nothing wrong with that. And to have, like you said, Stu, a 22 year old who's capable of doing that, who, you know, a few years ago, people thought maybe Gouli could be a top four defenseman. Now he looks like he could be a potentially top pair defenseman uh, going forward for this team. So there's a lot of positives with Caden Gouli continually, but. I would like to see him back on his natural side at some point, just to see how far his game has progressed since the last time we saw him there. Right. And I, I do think he is the best defenseman on this team in is in his totality right now. Matheson's a better offensive defenseman, a better skater, obviously, and can probably play more minutes. Cause I think you could play him 40 minutes a night and he wouldn't even be breathing hard, but uh, you don't need to do that. You can rest him a little bit. Well, David Savard with Jack, I mean, what that was a what a smart move by the coaching staff to do that. And go back to last season, it was David Savard who played with Caden Gooley as a rookie and settled him down. And we're seeing now why you know, Kent Hughes decided to keep David Savard. We don't know what offers he did or didn't get at the trade deadline, but David Savard is a valuable guy in this rebuilding process as a player and almost like a, a coach on the ice also. So what do you think has happened with Raphael Harvey Pinard this season? He only has one goal. Uh, what, what What's happened? Andrew, do you have any theories? Uh, Raphael Harvey Pinard, Josh Anderson, and Cole Caulfield did something in the offseason to anger someone. And this is the result. I, I really don't know. I think the main thing with Harvey Pinard that I see is he's like a little Swiss army knife. He fits in so many situations and he excels in so many situations. So... Again, not really worried. I don't think he was ever going to score like he did last season. Just, you know, he's not going to play with Nick Suzuki most of the time. He's not going to get an opportunity to shoot that often. And he doesn't shoot that often, even when he is playing in those big opportunities. He's more of a, a guy who facilitates his line mates creating the offense and can chip in once in a while at the net front. And I see a lot of value in him. I, uh, defensively, I think he's one of the best forwards on the Montreal Canadiens, especially on the PK. Him and Suzuki uh, behind Evans and Armia as the two PK forward groups have been excellent since they lost too many centers and had to start playing Suzuki on the sh uh, shorthanded again. But it's not for lack of trying, I'll say that. he He's had his opportunities, but I think the expectations for Harvey Pennard were maybe a little bit high coming out of last season because he scored so often and remember he started the season with an audition on that top line and injuries have been a factor for him as well it's been a terrible year for that so I don't know if he's ever really gotten his momentum under him this season it seems like he hasn't really had a chance and now he's playing you know five to nine minutes at even strength per night on that fourth line I'd like to see him get a bigger opportunity honestly I think he's contributing more than Josh Anderson is and you know you put him with Gallagher and Evans You've got a line that, at the very least, makes opponents really mad every shift. Yeah, he's, he's missed he's missed thirty seven games because of injury, so that's definitely a factor. I think we're also seeing why he was a seventh round pick. I mean, he's, you know, he's, his work ethics there, the skill level isn't there to match. Uh, his shooting percentage last season, when he got fourteen goals in thirty four games, was twenty four point one percent. Which Andrew, you know more than anybody, that's insane. Uh, yeah, not happening. <laughs> the shooting percentage this year is 4.3%. Uh, 
So, um, you know, he, he, he's starting to remind me a little bit of Charles Hudo and one of those guys who can really can score in the AHL, but can't really bring that to the NHL level. But the work ethic is, I mean, there's a reason why in Laval they called him Lavaliger because he works just as hard as Brendan Gallagher. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look at, uh, he could do no wrong if you look at his last year of performance, finding, finding the net as often as he did, which... Uh, was fortunate for him and got him a new contract. But you know, playing with a with a good good line, of course, did help him. But if you look at you know the injuries the kid has had and uh, you know the amount of time that he's been given to uh, perform is is not what a young kid needs. And unfortunately, he's uh, he's he's not given the the type of opportunity that he that he's had before. So. That being said, I don't foresee um, great things happening in the future with uh, a, a good kid, good hardworking kid like this. I think that his type of uh, player can be replaced with somebody with a little more uh, skill set. And you know, unfortunately for him, he's uh, he's dealing with uh, uh, what he's been given this year, which is a, obviously a real tough year. Well, that's it for us this week. Thank you for joining us. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out YouTube channel. Make sure you sign up for the Hockey Inside Out newsletters. Just go to montrealgazette.com slash newsletter. And of course, check out hockeyinsideout.com to find all your Habs daily coverage. And uh, we'll see you here next week.